from University of Otago. Um, he's an atomic physicist um, and general enthusiast on science and so forth, and he's got some interesting components to gravitational waves. So I'm just in the first sort of 10, 15 minutes going to skim over my big telescopes talk in, in, a, in a sense to sort of set the scene for why we're really focusing or, or, or so uh, enthusiastic about these gravitational waves and the sort of box or the door that it's opening for us to, to make some new discoveries. Um, so we did this talk in Whangarei, um, well received there, and uh, hopefully uh, it's equally well with you guys here. So in terms of observing the universe, for thousands of years, these are the instruments that human beings used. You're all familiar with them. Uh, most of you have got two that are in reasonable working order. Um, but you'll all be aware of the limitations. Uh, the primary objective lens here, depending on your light adaption, is somewhere between 2 and 8 millimeters. And that, of course, means that there's only so much you're going to see about what's up there to observe at night time. And, of course, that uh, was the limiting factor in terms of what we could see. And it is a lot of the reasons that um, people initially thought perhaps the Earth was the center of the universe uh, and all the other various things. All that changed in 1609. We went from 2 to 8 millimeter eyepieces <laughs> up to 37 millimeter eyepieces. That long tube there is just under a meter in length. It's, uh, it's, it's actually a replica of Galileo's original uh, instrument. Uh, so he literally opened his eyes. The magnification that he achieved on that was about 19.5. With this, he discovered that Venus had phases, Jupiter had moons. There were some weird bunny ears around Saturn. <laughs> In his time, he couldn't quite discern that they were actually rings. That came a few years later. Uh, and indeed, that the sun had spots on it wasn't a perfect orb. So, with the development of the optic technology of the refractor, the one on the right hand, uh, left hand side here, um, the universe, or our eyes to the universe, opened up by an order of magnitude. And the discoveries uh, that were made were things that nobody in all of human history had to dare even dreamed or imagined. Uh, and out of that came a fresh understanding. You put the sun in the center of our solar system. Um, it explained that uh, you know our Earth was a planet like the other ones orbiting around, and so on and so forth. Next to that telescope, you see the technological advantage that uh, advance that happened about 60 years later, thanks to Sir Isaac Newton, and he built the reflector telescope, which is the more traditional one, and certainly the one that all the major telescopes are using these days. Um, primarily because it's a lot cheaper to build bigger reflectors than it is to build bigger refractors. Uh, and most of you will understand that a refractor bends the light, uh, and when you bend the light, you end up with the splitting of the spectrum, the rainbow effect coming out, and therein lies the problem, is when you split light out like that, um, the red light will have a different point of focus than what the uh, purple or violet light will have at the other end. <laughs> so, as we were looking at objects out there that had not just pure monochromatic light, but colored light, uh, the bigger you make your refracting telescope, the more complex your lenses have to be, composite lenses, in order to bring those focal points back together. And so that made a challenge, and even today, there's a limit, like that big, beautiful brass uh, refractor we've got up there, there's a limit to how big you can make those before it just becomes technologically impractical and you rely on the reflecting <coughs> technology. The instrumentation aside, the next revelation that our eyes were again a limiting factor in what we could observe in the universe came around in the year 19, uh, 1800, thanks to Fraunhofer, who decided to see if uh, the light in those different bands of the, of the rainbow there carried different levels of energy. And so to do that, as you can see in the diagram, he placed thermometers at each of the, the color bands, <coughs> and the idea was to have one just outside, it's not shown here on either side, but in fact he did them on either side, um, as a control. And the ones where there was no light observed should have been room temperature, should have been the control, um, 
and then the ones with color uh, with light falling on them should have been warmed up to some degree from the control. Well, lo and behold, the control out up just past the red one actually recorded more energy falling on it than the red one itself. And thus, he had to discern that although our eyes can see red, there's, a, there's more light beyond what our eyes are actually perceiving, and we explored or realized that there was infrared and ultraviolet. And so the light spectrum opened up in terms of our understanding of the universe um, to the point where we today <coughs> split the light spectrum. The visible part is actually a very small part of the light spectrum. Uh, all the way up at the very top, we've got the gamma rays, which coincidentally is spelt wrong in that graphic, so given that I stole it, I won't complain to me. Um, uh, all the way down to the TV and radio signals, and of course, most of you probably have a microwave in your, in your kitchen, and that is using light or electromagnetic radiation. And as our understanding of physics developed, we came to realize that this light was coming in packets of energies. Today we call them photons. And one way of uh, generating photons is by putting energy in and out and letting it come out of atoms as it, the um, electron uh, energy states jump up and then readmit the photons out. So with that understanding, suddenly we realized that the electromagnetic spectrum if we have the instrumentation that can see things beyond what our human eyes can see, we get to learn a lot more about the universe that's out there. And so, with that sort of technology, we built the telescopes bigger and bigger and bigger until we got, in 1948, up to the Hale Telescope here in Mount Palomar, San Diego. Uh, now, that's a 200-inch telescope, or uh, 5.1 meters. Uh, in diameter. That's a pretty big mirror. It is a single piece mirror and fair to say it's probably at the limit of what we could engineer one piece of glass in terms of physical size. Uh, to give you an idea of how big a 5.1 mirror is, I did a little um, sort of sitting in the middle of the mirror and there you get the impression. Um, from this you can also see the weight of that piece of glass because that is the concrete blank they used when they were commissioning the telescope as an accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Someone stole your name. That's the second time it's gone boom. Okay, let's see if we can uh, resurrect that. Uh, that's Natalie Batala, by the way, who's coming through doing the lecture tour in October, so do make sure you get, uh, get along to that. It's well worth it. Uh, <coughs> I've uh, talking to her <coughs> some time ago, and PowerPoint has gone bang again. Okay, what are we going to do here? So the Hale 200 inch was the technical, technological limit for a single piece of glass. From there, to get bigger, it took us until the 1970s and 80s to get the engineering right to have multi-segment mirrors. And here you see the big, uh, I think they're 10.2 or 10.4 meter telescopes, uh, the kick ones up on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And again, we sort of had a plateau. This was as big as we could make it um, without sort of running into major sort of challenges uh, in terms of stability and uh, focus and all that sort of stuff. And fair to say that in the 1990s there was a little bit of competition between these telescopes and this one here, <coughs> which is much smaller. I think this is 1.8 meters. 
But of course, this has the advantage of being well over 400 kilometers away from the Keck telescopes in a pure vertical direction. In other words, this doesn't have to contend with our fickle atmosphere. Um, and when I spent a bit of time with the, uh, the guys at the Hubble Space Telescope, and I mentioned mm -hmm. the, all the technology they're putting into the ground telescopes and how they, the guys at Mount Palomar were saying they're getting images that rival what the Hubble is doing now, the Hubble guys sniggered. Um, because they think, of course, that this is uh, always going to give them a better view. And today, yes, horses for courses. This, of course, is a hideously expensive way of doing astronomy. Um, whereas doing it on a ground-based telescope, even a 10-meter telescope, whilst it's expensive, is not hideously expensive. So this has opened our eyes even further and allowed us to see right back to the very earliest, sort of the recombination era, um, with the thing print of the Big Bang, uh, amongst other telescopes. But of course, we're never satisfied. You know, what we've done in the 400 years since Galileo is we've taken a two to four millimeter eyepiece that is a human eye, and we've literally made it 10 meters in size. Uh, but not being satisfied with that, they proposed some bigger ones. So, having a look at this picture, on the first column there, you see the Hale Palomar Telescope, uh, just a little bit down with the big dot in the middle. Uh, that was 1948. So there you get the primary mirror sizes by, by comparison. So a lot of these telescopes, you can see the dates came online uh, between the 90s and early 2000s. The Large Binocular Telescope in 2005. Uh, the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, <laughs> Chile, you see those sort of four uh, Tadish um, or yeah, foreign looking type of telescopes that work in unison. They're there. Uh, the Magellan Telescope, then the giant Magellan Telescope. You can see the naming convention that people start using here. Um, and then over here, you get a sense for the telescopes that are coming. And this is what I personally think is going to make the 2020s probably one of the most exciting eras in astronomy. Because if you look at what the Hale telescope is like out there, and remember, that is the telescope that, you know, Hubble used the hooker, the, the, the one that half the size, to observe the expanding universe. He literally blew our universe apart from just a Milky Way galaxy to the entire <coughs> universe of galaxies. Uh, and he did it with a telescope this size. By the time uh, the 30 meter and the European extremely large telescope. <laughs> this is one, or just under one square kilometer of surface area. By way of a light bucket, that's huge. The other telescope you might have heard of in that sort of scale is the big radio telescope being built in Australia, South Africa, the square kilometer array. Different type of technology collecting the bigger long wavelengths. Um, but basically, in both optical and radio, we're working towards building telescopes that are a square kilometre of collecting area. Uh, and that's going to introduce a lot of... Uh, it, it's going to be as revolutionary as Galileo's first telescope that just opened the door. Now, to put it into context, this is a tennis court, and that's a basketball court. So you can see on the you know, European extremely large telescope, um, they could fit a couple of basketball courts with space, uh, space to spare. So these are seriously massive telescopes, many, many, many segments in there. Um, and just to sort of give you an idea, this is the 30 meter telescope, or the artist impression of it that they're trying to build on Mauna Kea. Um, You've probably heard a lot of controversy. They're having issues with uh, the ground and getting the approval of uh, the, the local people and all that sort of stuff, and they're working through those processes. Uh, but we certainly hope that to come on stream uh, in the early 2020s. Uh, it's counterpart from the European. This is an American effort primarily from the European ones. Uh, this is the extremely large telescope. Uh, the picture doesn't really do it justice until you realize that these little things down here are four by four vehicles. Um, so seriously massive. If you think our dome is impressive when it moves around, just have a look at what it would take to engineer moving that 
uh, it is a multi-story building in its own right, just in the dome. Um, but it's not all just about size. This is the one that I think is probably going to um, be the longest lived in terms of human exploration, certainly in our lifetimes and perhaps for the next uh, century or so. It's called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. It's only 8.4 <coughs> metres in size, um, but with a 3200 megapixel camera, this is literally going to sample the sky periodically every night of the year and put that into a database can at the rate of 15 terabytes per night. Now one of the things that astronomers uh, sort of struggle with these days is to get telescope time. If you've got a research uh, area of interest or whatever, then you have to find the right telescope and then you have to try and book in time to it. And it's highly contested. It's, it's oversubscribed to the tune on these big telescopes of at least about seven, maybe eight to one. In other words, every one hour of observing those telescopes do, there's another seven hours of legitimate, valid research projects that just haven't come up to the same criteria and miss out. These types of telescopes, you don't necessarily subscribe to survey time. These things are just <laughs> doing surveys all the time but everybody can go and interrogate that database. Um, okay, there'll be a fee to get in there and there'll be a certain uh, sort of cost to get that much data moved around, but it'll collect that information for 10 years. And I would suggest that I, I can't see any reason why for the next 100 years research astronomers won't be going to this database to see what was happening in that particular region over a 10 year span, building up the long picture. And then once they've found their preliminary findings, then you can target it with more specific telescopes uh, and, and dig into it. So that's probably my personal favorite in terms of the telescopes coming on screen for the 2020s. And again, the mirror shot, this is what you can do when you've got an 8.4 meter telescope. Um, and that's the, the actual blank. Can't quite see it on this horrid projector, um, but there is it's a sort of uh, hexagonal uh, shaped uh, And of course, everybody knows what's launching, hopefully, in October of next year. James Webb Space Telescope. Um, unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which is in Earth orbit, this one's going out to a Lagrangian, a gravitational sort of uh, low point uh, that's going to keep it in orbit about two, two and a half, uh, three times the distance uh, from the moon. Uh, nice and isolated from all the noise that humanity is making. Um, and to put that in context, each one of those hexagonal squares is about the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> uh, so that's like 18 Hubbles in one telescope sitting out there. And i got a feeling that Natalie's going to talk about this one because uh, I do communicate with her on Facebook a little bit occasionally and she does talk about this one a fair bit. I just don't know if she's actively involved uh, or, or just sharing information about it. Um, but certainly it's been interesting to watch that development and there's one other mission, I think it's, there's a mission due to go to Mercury and if they get that spacecraft in time uh, through all the launch tests and all that, we could bump this, uh, the launch of this for October. Uh, but if that Mercury mission misses, then the uh, James Webb Space Telescope goes up in October of next year. And they're all based on the electromagnetic spectrum, those photons of light that uh, float around there. As the video showed beforehand, you may not recognize it from uh, the instrument you saw there, but this is also a telescope. Two big long arms, about four kilometers in size, going in orthogonal directions, 90 degree inclines. Uh, and this is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, otherwise known as LIGO. Uh, so this is the one in Louisiana. Um, I was fortunate to be able to, uh, to visit that at a conference and uh, we sort of stood down this end of the pipe. This is the big uh, sort of shroud that's around the vacuum seal pipe. And if ever you come across somebody who thinks the earth is flat <laughs> and they don't listen to any other arguments, get them to stand at one end down here. And you can't see it from the picture here, but as you look down there, you can clearly see that for this pipe to be straight, 
but down the other end, there's about a three-story pillar holding it off the ground. So that's the curvature of the Earth after four kilometers. Um, very definite there. But of course, this is a very different type of a telescope to what we're used to of you know, Galileo's time looking through the telescope with their eyes. Uh, this is how you look through the telescopes these days. Right? So in other words, you can do it from the safety of your home. Um, even the big research telescopes on Mauna Kea and so forth. Astronomers don't go up there and play with the telescope all night and all that. You couldn't trust them. They'll break it. Uh, there's specific technicians who will actually run and drive those telescopes and uh, point them and load the instruments and so forth. And the data will be delivered nicely as a big sort of Dropbox type of file back to the astronomer sitting somewhere else in the rest of the world. Um, so yes, going up for a field trip might be nice, but uh, that's, that's certainly not the way a professional research astronomer does things uh, in, in the main. So this is really my introduction, where I hand over to Dr. Abel Schwartz, because this introduces gravitational observing. So I'd like to give him a nice warm welcome. <laughs> why they don't let scientists into these big facilities. When I was doing my PhD, I was working on a one meter telescope. I was exhausted. I fell asleep on the control of the dome. And I woke up to a <laughs> And I let the dome go 360. <laughs> I had to call the supervisor and I got kicked out for a month. <laughs> oh yeah, we need control. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so I'm here to tell you a bit about uh, the gravitational waves. Um, start. Hopefully it will not collapse. Um, so this is a sort of a brief uh, introduction to what I'm going to say to you guys. So first of all, why is it even important to us? Uh, what is it? Uh, how do we detect it? A bit of the LIGO. Uh, about the detection <coughs> themselves. And a bit about where to next from here. Um, basically, they said everything in the 10 minutes uh, video, so I'm done. <laughs> okay, so just a bit about Einstein. I think uh, most people know that he was uh, probably the first scientific celebrity. If uh, he was today, he was probably be having a talk show. But I think I found this quote, one of his many. Uh, I think that's a really cool one. I'll read it to you, even though you can see it. So what is, it, what is gravitation? Gravitation and relativity. Gravitation cannot be held responsible for people falling in love. How on earth can you explain in terms of chemistry and physics so important a biological phenomenon is first love? Getting quick. Put your hand on a stove for a minute and it seems like an hour. Sit with that special girl for an hour and it seems like a minute. Now, that's relative. <laughs> I, think, I think that's, that's kind of but Einstein, Einstein was, was a special figure in history. He really, uh, just a few seconds about him. I think the most that I, uh, I took from his story that as a kid and then as a young scientist is that he was a great experimentalist. People think, oh, he did theory. No, he was a great experimentalist and an observationalist. The thing is, what was unique about him, he did everything in his imagination. He did experiments in his imagination. He had something that probably other people had as well, but that was something special. And this is part of what, what I'm going to talk to you about today. So let's start. Why is this important? Why gravity is important? So we have four fundamental forces in nature. Three of them, the strong, the weak, and the electromagnetic uh, uh, interactions, they are governed by quantum mechanics, which I am not going to discuss today. <laughs> But gravity is a bit different. Gravity, as we know today, is governed by general relativity derived by Einstein. Now, the first three are uh, around really close interactions. There are between atoms and nucleus and all the uh, uh, quantum particles. Gravity is a long range one. It's a long range interaction. The major difference between them quantum mechanics and uh, GR, general relativity, is that in some ways, in a simplified way, quantum mechanics deal with what we can look as 
bumping or interaction between particles, marbles, little balls of matter. General relativity is completely different viewpoint on the universe. And that's what I'm going to focus on. So let's move forward. Now, the big question, or one of the big questions, is how gravity works. Now, as you might see from this beautiful nebula, we have all the forces in this nebula interacting and doing stuff and creating stars and creating planets and creating whatever. Gravity is the one that controls it all. It's the biggest one. It's the long range interaction. It's on cosmological scales, astrophysical scale as well. Now, before I get to GR, gravity, as you might notice, you're all sitting down and not hovering. It's an everyday life, right? So just as a simple example, we have this baby that I think puked something on the floor. We have the Pisa Tower. We have uh, all kinds of other examples. We have tides, which is, again, a gravitational pull uh, with the moon and also the sun, actually. And we also have this little cool thing, which I really like. So we all have the Sicardian clock here. It's a membrane that actually vibrates. And that little thing, that little membrane, is actually the control room for all our activity during the day and night. With specific frequencies, that thing tells us to wake up, go to sleep, eat, eat. For me, in my case, it's eat, 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 all the way around. And that's actually cool because it changes the, the vibrations and that's how we know to do all our stuff. Now, this is related directly to the gravitational pull on Earth. It will be different if we were on Mars or the Moon or whatever. Now, let's continue. Relativity and gravitation. So, originally, Newton was the first one to come up with the universal law of gravity. And I think a lot of people know the famous story that he has an apple dropped on his head, which, from what I know, that's just a fairy tale. Right? <laughs> Maybe he had something else fall on his head because he came up with really cool ideas. But he thought about the same way as two masses interact like that. Then came Einstein. Now, Einstein, what he did in the late 1800s, <coughs> 19th century, physicists thought, yeah, we more or less got everything worked out. There's few universal <coughs> problems, not really that important, you know, but more or less we understand how the universe works. But there was a little bit of problem with the two major theories, which was mechanics, classical mechanics, and electromagnetism. They do not go well together. And what Einstein realized is that gravity, according to Newton, actually is not that correct when we go to higher speeds than what we see in normal day. And also when we have much bigger gravitational forces involved. Now, in everyday life, we don't really feel these effects. But these corrections that Einstein did, first with special relativity and then with general relativity a decade later, really revolutionized everything. So let me tell you a bit about this thing. Now, special relativity, 1905, Einstein, biggest year probably. Uh, what he understood that the speed of light is constant. The outcome of that, one of the outcomes of that, is that space, spatial, x, y, z, what we say, <coughs> is actually in a, in a deep bound connection with time. We don't look at the universe any, anymore as space separated in time. It's joined together in an interesting way. And it gave all kinds of a bit weird uh, uh, phenomenons. Uh, for example, if you know about uh, one of the thought experiments is the twin paradox. Anybody heard about that? I'm sure. Yes. Yes? Yes? yes. No? Anybody doesn't know what that is? You don't. Okay, I'll say that in a minute. What you realize that you take twins, one of them stays on Earth, the other one gets shoot out into space in really, really high speed. I'm talking closer to the speed of light. When the other twin will come back, their ages will be different. The time is ticking in a different way. Now, this was actually proved. There was an experiment. This is without gravity at the moment, what I'm saying. There was an experiment uh, in, I think it was the early 60s. They took two airplanes, atomic clocks, and they went around the world a few times, and they found exactly the time dilation effect that Einstein predicted. That was including gravity, so it's a bit more complicated, but the concept is the same. So this is for real. 
back then it sounded like science fiction, but you know, a lot of things sound like science fiction, like who would believe that Trump get elected? <laughs> Unfortunately for us, it's real. So anyway, back to real life. So what Einstein realized 10 years later, it took him time, uh, sorry, two years later, then he, re he thought, okay, now I need to implement gravity into my, into my theory. It's not enough. I only get like constant speeds. That's, that's not enough. The world has gravity. So what is gravity? And then he was thinking, he had a great imagination. He was thinking, okay, if I'm on Earth, I'm feeling something pulling me. If I was in space and I was accelerating, I would still feel something that is putting a force on me. It's equivalent. Now, if I'm free falling on Earth, I feel like I'm hovering, right? If I fall in an elevator just before I die, that's the only thing I think of, right? The fact that I'm hovering. If I'm floating in space, I'm still feeling the same. So just imagine you put yourself in a black box. You will not know if you're falling on Earth or you're floating in space. And that's called the equivalence principle. Now, what's important about this, without going into too much details, is that this thing is, is uh, relevant regardless of the mass or the composition of your body. It doesn't matter how much you weigh, which is very nice if you want to stay beautiful. It doesn't matter how much you weigh, it doesn't matter the shape you are, it holds every time. That means gravity, as you can see here, it's not a property of the matter itself, it's a property of space-time. Now Einstein, what he imagined is that space-time actually is curved. Now, what do I mean by that? I will tell you. I don't have a nice demonstration, but I can show you in a minute. What that means is that Yes, we have matter in the universe. The planets, us, everything. <coughs> now, matter creates curvature in the space-time itself. Let's like, just imagine space-time as a blanket or some sort of a really tight uh, surface. And then you put a mess in another one, another one. That will create little holes or dimples in the, in the space-time. And that's exactly what he imagined. Also, the curvature of space-time is the one that sets the distribution of the masses. So it's an interaction between space-time and the mass. So matter and curvature is the same. And that's a completely different view of the universe. And that's from pure imagination. That is just incredible. I cannot even begin to imagine the moment he realized this thing. Now, as you see at the top, this is a very elegant, very short, little uh, uh, formula. That's Einstein's equation, the famous equation from general relativity. Now, this is quite simple to solve. Very elegant uh, looking. Problem is, it's not that easy because it's actually holding uh, 10 uh, nonlinear equations into this thing. So this is not something very high school material. And it is difficult to solve in, uh, in a lot of cases. So we only have a few analytical cases. But it's quite elegant to come up with something like this after 10 years, I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> the thing is, amazingly, he never got a Nobel Prize for this. He got it for the photoelectric effect. Which is still a cool thing. He should have gotten another one, that's what I mean. Anyway, uh, so just as an example, you see we have a few examples of matter in the universe, and this will, I just brought because I took this picture, so I wanted to show you. Show you. <laughs> That's what the telescope that I made go crazy completely. Okay, so just to, to summarize this part, here's an example of exactly what I showed, what I told you. We have this really tight uh, uh, sheet that's flat space time, no matter at all. And then when we put a, a mass in the middle, it becomes curved. And that's exactly how this thing is working. That's how the universe is. Now, let's imagine this big chunk of mass is the sun. And the little marble, that's Earth. Now, when we imagine stuff, we imagine the uh, uh, solar system, what we think is, hey, we have some sort of an interaction, and that little marble is going around the sun. But what Einstein imagined is exactly this. The sun actually creates some sort of a dip in space-time, curved space-time. And the Earth is getting attracted like a marble is falling into a hole. That's what we imagine. And that's mind-blowing, that's amazing, because, hey, flat space-time makes more sense, as well as three dimensions make more sense. But the world is not as we request it to be, it's what it is. 
Okay. Now, one of the coolest examples or uh, observations is <coughs> when we have a star, so the sun is curving space-time itself, or any star for that matter, and we are here on Earth, and we observe a star, but light itself can be bent as well. Everything can be bent by curvature of space-time, that's the whole point. Now, what you can see here is what we actually see. This is the bending of light. The actual star is actually in another position. What we get is the light being bent because of the same path the marble was doing. The light is being bent and reaching our telescope. So we think the star, because we imagine space is flat, we don't understand curvature, we think the star is coming, the observed star is coming from somewhere else. Now, this is real. This is real stuff, and you can see this incredible famous picture. What you see here, you have a galaxy there that is bending uh, uh, space-time, and there's uh, another galaxy around that, and you see the light is getting bent from all the places and reaching our Earth. So the actual light is coming from behind this thing, and it's getting bent like that. And this is called an Einstein ring. It's one of the perfect ones. So you see, this is for real. But the curvature is for real. Now, here comes the most simplified stuff of my talk. <laughs> this is Einstein original manuscript. <coughs> Anyone know German here? No, me neither. So, skip this. so a year after uh, the publication of General Relativity, he was thinking, OK, let's do something more interesting. Anyway, what he thought of, okay, what, we, what if we have a distribution of masses, like maybe two stars or something like that, and they are rotating around each other or do some sort of an interaction, a gravitational interaction. What he realized that they will be radiating energy out. Now, just skip this one so everybody knows this already. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. He got to this, which is, again, the most simplified part of my talk. What he realized, that the energy that's going to be radiated from specific uh, 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 distributions of masses, which I'll address in a second, will be coming out in the form of waves, which we call today gravitational waves. Now, he wasn't actually the first one to think about gravitational waves. Actually, Poincaré, famous mathematician, uh, thought about that. He didn't have general relativity in his head, of course. But he did come up with something like that. Einstein was the one that literally derived it from his equations. So yeah, let's give him credit. He was cool. Um, anyways, before I get into that, what are gravitational waves? Or what are waves in general? So a lot of you do know what waves are. Just imagine we have a pool. We throw some sort of a rock or a pillow. And then we see ripples on the water. Those are waves. We have sound waves, which is a bit of a different form of waves, but I think everybody has some sort of a concept what's up. Now, gravitational waves, let's see, are basically the same thing, only coming from a bit different bodies. So, from Einstein's equations, what you saw the element equation up there, when we have masses that are some sort of a, uh, either we have two bodies that are revolving around each other. They will start to in spiral in because of law of, phys laws of physics. And because of that, they will be losing energy. And that energy will be radiated out as waves. Now, another example, if you had a single body with a pimple on it, a big mountain or some sort of a deformity. Deformity? <coughs> There's a blah. How do you say that? Deformity. You see? That's why I'm cute. <laughs> that will also shoot out gravitational waves. A supernova can shoot out gravitational waves. I will be focusing more on the two bodies, but what's important to take from this is they propagate in the speed of light, these waves, and they are literally ripples in space time itself. 
I think you saw in the video when the Earth was doing that. That's an, a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, it's a nice way to get thin if you just keep it like that and get it gravitational. But this is really what it is. So you see two bodies spiraling in, and they shoot out these waves. These waves are literally space-time doing this. It's us. It's everywhere. It's you and me are now radiating gravitational waves, a very tiny one, very, very tiny. Now, I want to give you a bit of examples of, of the power this thing holds. What's gravitational? Why, why, why is it uh, so interesting? So let's start with a simple example. So this is a simplified uh, formula you can see up there. So we have the power emitted in watts. You see that factor in front of the formula. It's a quite a small number. That's a 0 0.0000001. And we have the frequency, and we have the mass of the object, and we have the length. Now, let's take a pen. We rotate a pen. A typical pen that will radiate 10 to the minus 64 watts. That is uninteresting. <laughs> now, let's take the Earth and the Sun. Now we go bigger. Okay, we have the Earth and the Sun. They go around each other. That will radiate, according to this formula, 200 watts. Which any of you know, mitre 10. Go and buy it. That's what you get. It's a light bulb. That's what we get from the Earth and Sun. We go bigger. Let's take Jupiter. Jupiter is a much more planet, we take Jupiter and the Sun, we get 5,300 watts, which again, if we go to Mitra 10 or Bunnings, I'm not trying to advertise anything here, I don't care, you get this, a simple engine. Yeah, it's not very impressive these days. Now, if we take, for example, double pulsar, so a pulsar, just for the ones that don't know what that is, it's a neutron star, it's a very compact, very, very dense, very, very a uh, heavy object, so a typical pulsar, it will be about 10 kilometers wide. It will weigh like about two suns. So I don't know if you know what's the weight of the sun, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. It's heavy, believe me, it's just heavy. Now, if it is an example, if you want some perspective, um, I don't have uh, this here, but can I borrow this? Everybody knows this. Right? This is actually heavy. If you take this, and this was made from material from a neutron star, so now I need to do a different calculation, that will be about 50 times Mount Cook. That gives you a bit of perspective for you, for you that don't know. So that's, 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 that's quite heavy stuff, that thing. It's very concentrated, heavy mass. Now, if there are two of them and they're rotating around each other, now, now we're starting to get to a bit bigger power here. A bit bigger. But I'll give you a perspective in a few minutes about what that is. Okay, so sources for gravitational waves. Uh, I'm going to focus more about the merging of two uh, 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 bodies. But like I said, we have other uh, stuff that can uh, generate gravitational waves. So when we have binary systems, like two neutron stars, two pulsars, or two black holes. Now a black hole is even more dense body. So take those two masses of the sun, I'll take it out to three masses of sun, but put it in three kilometers. That's even worse. Now if you look at that thing in matters of curvature of space time, just imagine I took that little marble compared to the sun, right, I'm talking about a neutron star now, and I put that will create a black hole Basically, for us, it creates a hole. Now, I'm not going into space travel and all this uh, stuff, but who knows? We need to understand how Trump got to this planet. <laughs> now, a black hole. So a black hole is even worse like the name. It's a black hole. Even light cannot escape from a black hole. So we have a, 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 a velocity for everybody. Now. Um, on Earth, the escape velocity is about uh, 11 kilometers per second, if I remember, more or less, 11. 11 kilometers per second. Now, what's the speed of light? 300,000 kilometers per second. Now, that thing has enough 
pool and not even let light help. So that's not a very good thing to happen in the neighborhood. So I was giving a talk, I gave this talk about a year ago and someone asked me, what are the chances that we can get one of these things in the solar system as if it was some sort of a visitor? I think we don't want any of these things in the solar system. So. Okay, moving on. So if we have a binary and spiraling it, okay, and eventually they merge, that will send out gravitational waves, like I said a few times. So we have two really compact objects, like black holes. They orbit each other really, really fast, by the way. They lose energy and they start spiraling in. Now, because they lose energy, they spiral in, they start to increase the frequency. It's like a ice skier that does this and then <coughs> does this and goes faster. It's the same thing. So the frequency increases. Eventually, so what we see here is exactly that part. They spiral in, spiral in, they increase frequency. You see the frequency changes. And then they start to merge. It's unavoidable. They will merge. And it's a very violent event, extremely violent. Eventually, they merge to one body, which is this part. And then there's a bit of a stability stage that they need to go through, you know, it's wobbling a bit, and then and it's wobbling. It's just one big black hole. But you can see here, this is really solving Einstein's equation. This is what we expect <coughs> the signal to be when we have these two objects doing this behavior. Now, Let's see uh, the simulation that I think he showed in, well, he showed something similar in the video, if this works, and it crashed. That's what happens when you got a gravitational wave. <laughs> you need help, dude? Come on. Well, if it doesn't work, we move on. Doesn't like us, huh? No. Oh. Doesn't seem to like us. No. I wanted to show you a big explosion. <laughs> oh well. Bear with me. Here's the simulation. <laughs> <laughs> and everything is in less than a second. It's incredible. Now the speed of these things is immense. We're talking 30% the speed of 100,000 kilometers per second spiraling. That's insane. That's crazy. That's cool. I like it. Okay, so before I get to the detection, they actually did observe indirectly uh, gravitational waves in the past. They were looking at pulsars. So a pulsar, why is it named a pulsar? I never really told you, the ones that don't know. It's because that thing radiates immense radiation in all wavelengths. Now, when that radiation, it spins really, really fast, the neutron star that I was telling you about, it spins really fast. And when that beam of radiation is directed towards us, so every spin it does, every revolution, it's like a lighthouse beeping. Dip, dip, dip. We get those signals. These are actually astronomical clocks, the most precise we have. It's really cool. Now, what they did is, what they do is they actually monitor these uh, 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 beepings. Okay, from the pulsars. Now, when you have two of them, and they're losing energy and radiating it as gravitational wave, that will change their beeping. That will change that, uh, that uh, pulse. And that's what they saw. They saw that the pulse is changing in time. So this is a scale of years. So they're actually in spiraling in and losing energy and radiating it, radiating it as gravitational waves. How do we know? We predict. We use Einstein's general relativity and you see that beautiful line? That's what his theory predicts. I wish I had that curve in my publications, but I have this size of error bars on it. It never works like Einstein. He was really good. Yeah. Okay, so what the effects are on us. So you see it in the movie, much cooler movie. But basically, it stretches and compresses space-time itself. Not in this scale, obviously, but in a smaller scale, which we'll, we will discuss in a second. But it's literally us being mostly compressed, hopefully. 
Now, regarding the detection itself, let's move on. So they have uh, the LIGO in Hanford, Washington, and Linux in Louisiana. These use what's called an interferometer. Now, an interferometer is a device that basically uh, takes waves of light and combine them, and we get a pattern called interference pattern. Why is that important? It's important because that pattern is sensitive in all kinds of ways. One of the basic ways that it's sensitive to the length of the arms that we use. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, that interferometer uh, specifically. Before I get to that, there is actually something that I know from a few days ago. That's August 1st. There's the Vero. It's another, it's not a LIGO. It's a bit smaller. This is operational now. Not in full scale, but it is on. And it's important, and I'll tell you why. First of all, it's always good to have more observatories. Obviously, we need to justify public funds. <laughs> like my salary. <laughs> now, there's another one that's being built, well, designed in the U and built in the US, and hopefully they will let it out to go to India. So we're going to have another LIGO. And there's another sort of a, an interferometer being built in Japan. Obviously, you see we have nothing in the southern hemisphere. Now, I don't know exactly that reason, but the Australian government is actually supporting LIGO for a long, long, long time. When the Americans told them, okay, let's take part of the funding and build a LIGO in Australia, they said, no, we just want to give you money. <laughs> when you say that to people, they will say, okay, cool. So we will build the LIGO with your money. And that's what they did. Now, the LIGO. So, like you've seen before, this is a very, very long arm. So, basically the way it works, I'm giving you the basics. So, they have a laser, and they split the light. Half of the light goes into one arm, the other one goes into the other arm. They get bounced back by the nerves. They go back, they recombine, and form an interference pattern. Now, what you've seen in the movie is nothing. <laughs> I built you a Lego. <laughs> I like mine. Now let's see if it's working, because it has stage five. <coughs> Hooray! We got Lego. Everybody, well, most of you can see that. You can come and play with that later. Now, Peter warned me not to shout. Fine. Let's hit it. Let's hit it. Did you see that? It's kind of hard. But anyways, what I'm trying to get to, here is our laser source. The laser goes in. Mm -hmm. We split the light, one, half of the light goes into this arm, the other one goes into this arm, bounce back by the mirrors, recombine, and here we got the interference pattern. When a gravitational wave comes in, from whatever, it will stretch or compress one arm compared to the other, and that will make the pattern shift. Now what they actually do is they don't look at the pattern like this, you see we have bright and dark and bright and dark and bright and dark. They actually put the dark. <coughs> they managed to, so I can do that actually as well, as good as they can. You see I can play with the density of the pattern and all that by just playing with the mirror. What they actually do is they put only the dark stripe on their detector. When the gravitational wave come in, what will happen is a bit of the bright one will kick in. They do that in a simplified way because it's easier to see in complete darkness a few photons, a, a bit of light, instead of having complete saturation and see a dip in the light. It's, in, it's a bit more complicated than that, but that's actually one of the basic reasons. So that's what, that's what they do. Now, Linux in Louisiana and Hanford. Uh, what's that? I really want to try to shoot. Give me a second. Hello! I told you it's going to work. Where's me? <laughs> yes. Okay, so what you see here, this is called the Michelson interferometer. It just does a simulation of what I just explained to you. So we have the source, we split the light. Half of it goes to, the mirror, goes to this mirror, the other half to this, they bounce, and they form the pattern. You just see it like that. What they actually do in LIGO, so this was the original plan. Then the, about, I think, 13 years ago, 2004 or something like that, they started implementing what's called the advanced LIGO. So they added uh, um, some other stuff 
beyond these mirrors, it's a cavity, it enhances the signal a lot, it enhances the sensitivity a lot, it makes the laser bounce a lot more time. Also, by the way, just to give you a perspective, they use the source, it's something like, um, I don't remember the numbers, it's something like a 30 watt laser, that, that's, that's a lot. Once it gets amplified, that is 100 kilowatt laser. So you don't want to be in the area when that thing hits you. That, that's a massive telescope. Now, why, why did they use that? Again, because the length of the arms is the sensitive part. So if we change the length of the arms because of gravitational wave, that we can recognize. Now, if there was no gravitational wave, its space curve is relatively flat in the area. Here's the mirror, here's the beam splitter, and here's the mirror. What will happen, so this is one arm and this is the other one, like I showed you. If a gravitational wave in, comes in, it will actually bend space time. It will make the lengths different, and we will see that signal. And that's what they are hoping to see, and that's what actually they saw. Now, just to give you a perspective of the detection, what's the size of this gravitational wave, I gave you powers, but that thing, thank you, is very, very far away from us. Because if it was near, we would not be standing here talking, we will be deformed. Now, to give you a perspective, what's the sensitivity they wanted to reach? So, a gravitational wave on Earth, some typical model of distance and immensity and all that, that's like trying to understand, to identify a difference in length to the length of the arm of about 10 to the minus 22. So that's 0 0.0000001 of a meter. Just to give you a perspective, that's like trying to identify the diameter of an atom compared to the distance from the sun to Saturn. So astronomical club, you know what's the distance? On average, 9.5 astronomical units, about 1.5 billion kilometers. Ratio. So we're talking an immense project here. This is not something simple. We need sensitive detectors. Problem is, we are also on Earth. What do we have on Earth that can change stuff? Earthquakes. Unfortunately, in New Zealand, we know quite a lot about that. We have earthquakes. We have all the electronics. We have the mirrors themselves with the formations. Uh, the Trump administration. The Trump administration. The Trump. That's that's the biggest error in the signal. <laughs> we need to take care of a lot of it. So they have about 120 monitors monitoring all the seismic, all the electronics, everything, everything, everything. Actually today, just to give you a bit of information, what's the most limiting part is actually the laser itself. It's because the, the laser light hitting the mirrors, it's a bit of a random thing into it. It's a random process because it's photons hitting the mirror. And because it's random, we don't know how many photons are hitting. And that actually gives a bit of energy to the mirror, it vibrates it a bit. So actually the major goal today is to get that laser beam more under control. If anyone is interested, I can talk about that later. But as you might notice, this is a formidable task. Now, the events themselves, so the first event, I will be discussing that mostly. So we have three detections so far. And from what I know, a uh, bit of uh, you know, colleagues of mine, so there's an observational run at this moment, it's supposed to end, I think, in about two and a half weeks. They have two more candidates. So we might actually have two more gravitational wave events coming up soon, which is really exciting. So the first event, they turned on the advanced LIGO, and a few weeks later, hooray, we didn't expect this. That's cool. We usually take 25 years to get a detection. <laughs> No, we have excuses for the funding now, right? So, about two years ago, the LIGO detectors saw very similar, similar signals. So, gravitational wave came in. Now, there was a distance of about 3,000 kilometers between the two gravitational telescopes, or observational, or observation, observatories. That means if those waves are propagating in the speed of light, that means there will be a time lapse between the two events in the two detectors. And that's exactly what they estimated. So, depends on the direction that it's coming from and all 
kinds of other considerations, they estimated that the time gap between the two detections will be between 5 and 10 or 12 milliseconds. It's really short, it's fast, it's the speed of light. And on the 14th of September, they saw 7 milliseconds apart detections, and there was another one about four months later or three months later, and a new one this year, and hopefully two more. So what did they see is what we discussed a few minutes ago, the inspiring Lingen, and then starting to merge, very violent, the amplitude also gets bigger, and then a ring down, and then it's, it's just a black hole. So, of course, in real life, not like simulation, we have noise, and that's what we see. So it's really hard to understand the initial the spiraling in. Well, it's a lot of noise, <laughs> but then we have a clear pattern. Again, with noise, just the science, that's what we get, mostly in my experiments. <laughs> and then this is the ring down. Now, what they did here is that they actually shifted one of the signals just to see the matching. And you can see that, of course, the, the noise is different in both detectors, it's obvious. But they also uh, um, did the simulation, many of them, and they tried to understand what caused this event. So, let's just move on. So, you all know this, but it's always fun if it's working. Yeah, this one works. Let's, <coughs> I just love them. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> let's see if it's moving. So what, what does this mean, actually? What they have is they have a gravitational wave in a frequency that is actually quite close to well, the lower frequencies that we can hear. And they do a computer mimic of that thing. They just take the frequency and they do a simulation. And we can literally hear this. This is, this is amazing. So until now, we can see the universe. We have telescopes. Now, in some ways, we actually hear the universe. And, and it's, it's just incredible. And like you saw in the movie, nothing can stop gravity. It goes all the way back to the Big Bang. And we'll talk about this in a second. Now, uh, let's, let's talk about the first event. I'm going to focus on that. Um, the first event, we estimate, so, OK, before I do that, what, what I said about they do simulations, they actually detected that thing in uh, September. They published it, I think, six or seven months later. Why is that? First of all, they don't want to scale. They want to make sure this is not some sort of a blip in the detection. Some guy was eating ice cream somewhere in the control room. That can cause problems. Trust me. <laughs> uh, some guy fell asleep on the controls. Trust me, I've done that. Anyway, don't hire me. You get the event. That's the conclusion. What they do is actually the following. Solving Einstein's equations for many, 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 many cases, about a quarter of a million cases, with different masses, with different distances, with different frequencies of inspiring in, until they manage to get the best scenario that matches the data. That's what they do. Now, this is not getting, we're 95% sure. This is not even close to being good. Not even 99% sure. This requires a lot more. We have to be sure. If any of you remember, a few years back, there was a, a claim that they discovered a faster than light particles. Everyone, anyone heard about that? I'm sure a few of you. You remember what was the reason why it wasn't? The connector and time. Yeah, the connector was not connected. <laughs> so you need to be careful. You need to be careful. You cannot stay. Just to give them a bit credit, they really messed up, but they are actually good scientists. So let's, let's give them a bit credit. Uh, so I think they took that case and, okay, we need to make sure that the connector is connected this time. So they did. They made sure, and they made sure that they actually understand what they're saying. So it's literally going through a quarter of a million options until they get the best possible scenario to match the data. And it's a lot of work. We're talking hundreds of theorists working on now, to give you a bit of perspective what 
dating happened. So the event happened about 1.4 billion light years away from us. Good. The beginning was two black holes. They were going around each other. One of them was 35 times the mass of the sun. The other one was 30 times the mass of the sun. I still didn't tell some of you what's the mass of the sun for you that don't know. We'll get to that in a second. But you can imagine it's quite heavy. I don't need to tell you the actual number, right? Now, <clears throat> after they merged into the single body, it was a 62 times the mass of the sun. Now, for the quick ones among you, you will see we have a bit of a problem here. 35 plus 30, initially, that's 65. Lift is 62. We just lost three solar masses worth of energy. E equals mc squared. The quick ones of you will get a really, really big number. That was colossal. That was huge. <clears throat> Luckily for us, it was 1.4 billion light years old. Now, they radiated three times the mass of the sun in radiation. Now, just to give you a perspective, the energy released by this, uh, three solar masses, so if you want the actual peak, that was 10 to the 49 watt. I still didn't give you a perspective of that, I promise. That, that's, yeah, that's my next slide. Almost. Let me just give you a bit more details about this. So, they, the event was very fast. These things don't last long. It was about 0.2 of a second. They speeded up from 30% the speed of light, which is relatively slow, as we all know, to 60% the speed of light. That's incredibly fast. The orbital frequency was about 75 hertz. And the model tells us, like I told you, the two masses, the 35 and 30, they were separated about 350 kilometers. So just to give you a perspective, the distance I work in the South Island in Ohio, Christchurch, Dunedin, about 350 kilometers. Average size of the cities, about the size of, um, well, it depends. Dunedin is quite big, but the CBD is about 300 meters. But size on average is about a few kilometers, like a black hole. These were massive black holes. Now imagine Dunedin and Christchurch going around each other in half the speed of light. I told you it's not boring in the South Island. <laughs> okay, a bit of perspective. What are three solar masses worth of radiation, of energy? Largest man-made explosion ever that we know. The Tsar Bomba, 50 megatons of TNT. That is worth about two kilograms of sun. <laughs> You can buy that in a local grocery store. <laughs> now, by the way, the mass of the sun is about 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. So you need to understand what we detonated on Earth, well, the Russians did, is a tiny, tiny bit. And we are talking three masses of the sun. That's just something beyond comprehension. Now, this event, just as a pure, simple estimation, was about 50 times greater than the combined power of all the light radiated by all the stars in the observable universe. If that's not enough, then I'm out. <laughs> you, you think it's something. <laughs> Where was it in the sky? So, I told you that we have two LIGOs. Problem is with two LIGOs, we cannot really pinpoint where the source is in the sky. Also, until we understand we have an event, it takes us months. That's another problem. So you can see what we have here. Uh, this is the first event. This is the Milky Way. This is the night sky. It happened somewhere here. The other one happened somewhere here. This was an interesting thing. There was a fourth event, but it didn't manage to get to the threshold that we set the bar at. I told you we need to be extremely sure that it is a gravitational wave. We're not that sure in this event. It was just below the threshold. But you can see the problem. We don't know where it's coming from. So if we would pinpoint it, we can maybe see some sort of an event if it's a supernova or whatever. We can see something. Hopefully we can see something. That's why the Virgo, the Virgo in Italy, 
it's, it's important because then we can do triangulation and we can pinpoint much better where the source is and maybe we can see something Now, these are the three events that I was talking about. So the first event is here. We have 62 solar masses, about 350 kilometers, 1.3, 1.4 billion light years. The second one was actually smaller. It's only 21 masses of the sun. That's puny. Um, and different diameter, of course. And the last one discovered about uh, uh, eight months ago. You see now it's much further away. It's about 3 billion light years. And it's somewhere in the middle in mass. It's between these two events, which we like. Scientists adore when they have a few points and they fill the gaps. We're happy. We're happy. That's good. Now, let's continue. What are the consequences and consequences of all this? First of all, the most important thing, gravitational waves exist. We waited 100 years for this to happen. Now, they started LIGO somewhere around the 70s. That's a lot of patience going through a lot of administrations, a lot of fun. That's impressive. The second thing that is impressive is that until now, we never have a, had a direct proof that black holes exist. This is it. Hopefully we get even better in the future, but this is it. This is incredible. Black holes exist. And the last thing, which is the sort of a twist, that we can hear the universe. We have a new set of tools to understand the universe. And this opens up opportunities that probably we don't really realize because we do have theories what's out there. I think we have pretty good understanding, but we also don't know a lot. And that's what's exciting, right? We have a new set of, we have a new instrument. Who knows what we're gonna find? We're finding all kinds of weird stuff. Probably you will hear from uh, Natalie in October when she comes about exoplanets, that's her field. You will hear all kinds of weird stuff you find. This is bizarre as well. And this is exciting because we don't know what to expect. There is a good chance a lot of the theories that we think of today will need to be changed. Once uh, one of my professors told me, professor in astrophysics, he told me, contrary to experimental physics, I mean uh, atomic physics like what I do today, in astronomy, we have actually a lot of data. The problem is understanding what the hell we're seeing <laughs> and now hearing. And that's, that's, that's uh, interesting. Now, um, some of you know, some of you know, what's the problem with light? First of all, if we take the model of the universe, the Big Bang and then inflation and the known universe, we have a problem that about 400,000 years back to the Big Bang, we cannot see. The universe is opaque. But the only thing that doesn't care about this is gravity, because that's space-time itself. Now, what I'm trying to get to is, hopefully, one day in the future, whenever it gets, if we get good enough sensitivity on the LIGO, or it's going to be another instrument, but basically the same concept, Hopefully, maybe, we will be getting information from this part. And that is something that I cannot even dream to understand at the moment what we're going to see. It's open. We don't know. We're excited. Hopefully, we'll get there one day. It's not going to be that close. But we don't know where technology is going to get us. So Now, I talked to you about the, we want to be sure. So the estimated false alarm rate, that means what's the estimation that we were wrong? So at the moment, what they found is for the first event, once every 200,000 years, we are wrong. I think that's a pretty good threshold to keep. So they are sure in about 99.99994%. I think that's not too bad. So yeah, they are pretty sure about this. What I mean, they are sure. They are sure that the two black holes, with those masses, with those distances, with that speed, is the explanation of that event. That's what I mean by that. Now, 
What about the future? I told you about hopefully maybe we can find stuff from the beginning of the universe, you know, hear stuff. So one of the projects, first of all, it's not showing here, but it's something I was messing around with lately, actually. So I told you we have what's called a Michelson interferometer here. That's a setup. They are looking into making different setups as well, less sensitive in, in ways to, for example, the rotation of the Earth, which is another noise. Uh, another big project that now, at least, is going to get, I guess, some sort of a funding to really start up, it's the LISA, it's the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. What are they going to do? Some way in the same way as the Michelson, they're going to have three bases out in space. They're going to shoot the lasers, they're going to form interference like this thing in the bit. More complicated way of interference, but the same concept. The difference is, I told you, it, the sensitivity depends on the arm length. The arm length here is going to be a million and a half kilometers. The real one on Earth is four kilometers. You do the math. It's going to be more sensitive. Of course, the other thing is it's in space. We don't have earthquakes. We don't have this. We don't have that. We have other problems. How the hell do you stabilize these things in space? It's a lot of technological steps we need to go through. It's not simple. But this is something, hopefully now, with the events that were discovered, it pushes the field. Ten years' time? Don't make me sign on anything here, but I hope ten years' time. The other thing that's a bit related to what I do today, so I did my, uh, my master's in fluid dynamics, then I moved to astrophysics and exoplanets I did. Now I'm an atomic physicist, so I'm not the best choice of career. Young people, don't look at me, I'm really bad at these things. I just am all over the place. What is another proposal is instead of using light, to use matter, atoms. Precise, not necessarily in the future, uh, only atoms, but at the moment. Today, even in our lab in Otago, we can create interference like this from <coughs> atoms. Atoms are quantum particles, quite complicated ones. But when they are really cold, if I take two atoms as an example, or an ensemble of atoms, they have properties of waves as well as particles. That's quantum mechanics, which I will not be addressing today. But why is it cool? It's cool because, first of all, here's an example of an interference pattern from atoms. So I'm talking for real here. We do that in the lab. Why is it a good way to do things? Because one of the limitations, and I don't have much time to talk about it, but I will say it in a sentence. One of the limitations of using light is that we are limited by wavelength of the light. With atoms, we have less limitations, let's say. Let's leave it at that. Just to give you a perspective, you remember in the beginning of the talk I was talking about the equivalence principle, right? The curvature of space-time. They managed to identify curvature or the equivalence principle, a test of the equivalence principle, with an atom interferometer about this size. No. This size sensitivity compared to a light of four <coughs> kilometers. This is one path towards the future, and this is something we are, not me specifically, we as scientists are working on at the moment. This might actually even happen faster than this. There is an atom interferometer on the International Space Station. Now, what I'm trying to get to is, hopefully, in the future, we can have an atom interferometer about this size that will replace LIGO about four kilometers. Now, just imagine what we can do with the 10 meter tower, which we actually have to do. That's something to think about. The last thing is that you can help, which is the best. So, I'm guessing uh, some of you know that uh, scientists use uh, uh, the public in a lot of ways. One of the things, oh, it's a bit fuzzy, but you can get the hang of it. It's called Einstein at Home. What they do is they actually send, they use your computers when you don't surf in all kinds of weird website. Website. Um, they use your uh, CPU, and they actually process some of the data of the LIGO. So if they find an event, 
you can claim, yay, my computer didn't crash when I was processing the data. And this is for real. You can literally uh, help them use your computer. You can do it with exoplanets and all kinds of other projects. I think even in the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. So check it out. This is cool stuff. And I think we should give respect to the guy that uh, made this all happen. He was something very special in history of science, actually history in general. I um, don't have enough words to describe his contribution. He was the founding father of general relativity and our understanding of the cosmos in large. And he was one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, even though he didn't like a lot of parts of it. Fair enough. But I want to end it with this smile because I think he deserves all the credit for this talk. So thank you very much. This time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He did very well. That was about 20 minutes shorter than the uh, first run. Uh, they paid it like the hours. Yeah. Quite possibly, one or two of you have got a, a, a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is not the simple question, it's the answer that is going to be. Yeah. So, any, any questions? Yeah. Uh, pictures. You know what? Uh, up the back. I tell you, sometimes you're working in two dimensions with the. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear you. How come you're working in just two dimensions, one along with the others, and these things are obviously sort of about going up or down in the earth? Or the welcome for you. I think when it's going to be the Lisa, actually, it's it's true. It's going to be, you know, that's that's correct. The, the technical challenges of building a perfectly straight vertical yeah. four kilometer column. <laughs> yeah. Even the ah, if you don't want to go deep into the ground, then you're going to have all kinds of other problems interfering. With your, you're going to get pressure. Like, just imagine drilling four kilometers in. You're going to get different pressures. I think that's a much bigger technological challenge that we appreciate uh, going deep into the ground. I think. Just give me one second. I think actually in that way. The future is atom interferometers, like I described, because the scale that we need to get the same sensitivity is orders of magnitude less. So we can use a 10 meter tower, which we have, by the way, they have in the US. Uh, to, uh, they don't do the LIGO at the moment, they do other stuff, but they get basically the same sensitivity, which is amazing. Uh, so, yeah, but it's a cool idea. You can but if, if you go 90 degrees around the year, you can look to your other axis, anyway. Yeah. Yes, sorry, we have. There's a black hole merger um, many times brighter than the brightest supernova. <laughs> yep. It's the radiation involved in the process. That's the meaning of. So it's some sort of a, a trying to give an example or a feeling of what's the actual radiation radiated. Yes, of course, it's a black hole. So. Yeah. I mean, in terms of brightness, you mentioned three solar masses. Mm -hmm. Don't. Don't take that to mean three times as bright as the sun. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about the entire mass of the sun. As if energy. you've been to my other talks, you'll know that over its 10 billion year lifetime, the sun only burns through one one thousandth of its mass. So, unimaginable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess this is why they want the uh, barometer so they can actually see if there is anything optically. Yeah, 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 exactly. So they want to pinpoint some sort of a location and maybe we can see, I don't know if there's an accretion disk around these two things, which I think that event will blow it away. But look, who knows? We don't know. We want to see where the source is, if we can. There's somebody over that side somewhere? No, no they know again. Okay. <laughs> That's Tony's department. <laughs> this side is the problem. <laughs> All right, uh, well, it's 9.30, we normally try to wrap it up about this time. You're welcome to come yeah, back. if you want to see this for a few minutes, minutes, shout at it. Just don't spit on it, someone spit on it. I cleaned it. All right, thanks for coming, everyone.